Thank you. Around 1990 was the collapse of the Soviet Union. For millions of people, it held the promise of political freedom. But for many more, it ended up being a time of extreme economic hardship. So in 1994, my family moved from the Ukraine to Germany in search of a better life. We didn't have much in the beginning. We tried to save money by cooking food at home and buying our clothes from the flea market. And that was not a problem. But the one challenge that we had is that we also didn't really have enough money to buy books. And without books, I might have never discovered my love for reading, might have never been inspired by the fictional and non-fictional people I got to meet in those books, and probably would not be standing here in front of you today. But what saved me was a tiny library, maybe 35 square meters tall, right next to our house. And while it was super small to me, for a small child, it contained the world. It was another book that helped me make sense of the significance of that situation. John Stuart Mill's On Liberty is a book about human flourishing. And Mill talks about not only the immense potential of human beings to be kind and wise, athletic and intelligent, to be the best versions of ourselves, but also the conditions required for that human flourishing to be realized. And that was really the starting point for me, to think about the type of conditions that are necessary for human beings to actually flourish. And pondering that question for years and working on it led me to a second question. How is it that the world is so imperfect given the vast amounts of money we spend on creating good conditions for people? Every year, we spend $250 billion in impact investing to create the type of products and services by social entrepreneurs to help. We spend over $500 billion in humanitarian and development aid to fight crises and solve development challenges. We spend trillions of dollars in government programs on education, social welfare and health to create, again, good conditions. So if we have all of that, how is it that we are still lacking so many good conditions for flourishing? A key challenge, I think, is the ability to recognize the needs of human beings, the individual needs. Let me explain this with an example. Imagine you are football coaches, and you have a team of young adults, and you want them to become the best football players they could possibly be. How do you do it? You know that some of them will be happy with the standard program that you provide, but others need kicking practice, and others, again, need running practice, and then some people need to practice offense, and some people need to practice defense. But how do you know all of that from the beginning? And now imagine you're not in charge of a football team, but you're in charge of a social program. You're in charge of feeding, of healing, of protecting, of educating hundreds or thousands of people. How do you make sure that people get what they need? Leo Tolstoy said it well when he said that happy families are all alike, and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. The problem is that we are very good at building programs for people that are already happy. But if we want to help people who are struggling, we need to recognize the individual needs. We need to meet them where they are. Now, it's interesting to think about how the private sector actually solves this challenge. The private sector has built an incredible amount of services that make sense of our individual desires and needs. And they use machine learning for that very complicated statistical models that go through large amounts of data and find patterns that are important to them. Let's take this event today. Some of you have algorithmically found it on social media, where you were recommended it. Others might have taken a ride-hailing app that algorithmically matches you to a driver and chooses the shortest route to get to this venue. 
And on your way, you might have listened to algorithmically recommended music um, that is tailored just to your individual needs. And later on, when people watch this video, maybe online, it will also be algorithmically recommended to them. So the company that we founded, Immalearn, is there to bring those techniques to the social sector, to give the social sector the power to recognize individual needs and respond to them. So let me give you an example of that. We work with a large American nonprofit in the US that educates 4,000 students each year. Those students come from difficult social backgrounds, ethnic minorities, and they work minimum wage jobs or are unemployed. The program is amazing because it takes those kids from the situation where they are in one year to Fortune 500 company jobs. But it's also very rigorous, and 30% of students drop out every year. So the question is, how can you reduce that dropout rate? How can you give more people the life-changing benefits of a socially and economically fulfilling career? Now, what we did is we built an algorithm that is trained on the thousands of students that they've seen in the past. And this algorithm does two things. It recognizes patterns of vulnerability. It takes all the data we have of a student and it says, have I seen this vulner vulnerability pattern before? And then it makes transparent to human agents why a certain risk score was given. What is the probability of dropping out and why? A student that has issues with substance use is not the same as a student that might have not an academic background in his family and just doesn't feel comfortable in this academic environment, or someone who doesn't have a card who can't get to the program in the first place. Those are all very different needs. So the machinery looks something like this. At the beginning of the semester, we make an educated guess. Some students just get the business as usual program, just a standard program like it always is. And some, pro some students are allocated to a monitor group. And there, they get additional attention. And then as the semester starts, we take in new information. Are students struggling with their homework? Are they, are they late? Are there certain subjects that seem to be harder for them than others? And we use that information to unlock an additional level of support for them if we feel that there is a lot of signs of vulnerability to prevent them from dro dropping out. Now it's clear that algorithms can be used to do harm in the world. Algorithms can just be wrong. You make a wrong recommendation. Algorithms can be biased. They can be biased against women. They can be biased against minorities. They can be biased against people living in poverty. And algorithms can be used to maintain power and maintain political oppression. So what are the principles that we need to follow in order for algorithms to be used in a beneficial rather than harmful way. The first principle is additionality. We never want to make algorithms take away resources from students. We only use algorithms to allocate additional resources more efficiently. So even if you're not considered vulnerable by the model, you still get the standard program you cannot be worse off. Second is transparency. We never use black box algorithms. Every algorithm transparently explains why a certain recommendation was given. And that helps human staff to have more informed conversations about the potential needs that exist within the student. But also it's an opportunity to contradict an algorithm, to say it's actually wrong in this case, and I will not follow its recommendation. The third principle is complementarity. Algorithms are trained on data, and that means that they are blind to whatever is not in the data. It is important to think about the topics that we're actually considering here. Academic success, motivation, happiness, well-being. Those cannot be captured completely in the data. So what you need is a synthesis of algorithmic judgment and human judgment to see the full picture. And the last thing is fairness. Because algorithms are trained on data, we should recognize that data is a codification of the past. It's usually an imperfect past because we as human beings are imperfect. And there are biases and there are injustices that happened in the past that are codified now in the data. So we need to make sure that the algorithms don't propagate those biases into the future. 
And so we work hard to first decrease the sensitivity of the algorithmic judgment on variables such as race and ethnicity and gender. And also we work very hard to highlight cases where those variables tend to drive a high share of the recommendation. So what do I want you to take away from this? I think human beings have an immense potential for flourishing, but only under the right circumstances. It's our job to create those circumstances. I was lucky that I had the right circumstances to flourish, but I don't want other people to be lucky, to have to rely on luck. With the responsible deployment of machine learning models, we have actually found a way to help some people without harming anyone else. To make sure that some people don't fall through the cracks if they don't have to fall through the cracks. And if we have this power at our disposal to make some people better off without making anyone else worse off, why would we not use it? Thank you very much.